Um, we've heard also now that there are very, two very, very different uh, approaches to potential cooperation with China. Uh, we heard from the EU, we heard from America, two very different uh, framings of that discussion, which is, of course, of crucial importance uh, also to Greenland. We will, however, turn the other way for a moment to Canada. Of course, a, in many ways, a very close neighbor, uh, geographically, culturally, linguistically, and so forth. Um, and we will have two speakers who somehow will address the proximity, the partnership, the potentials between Greenland and Canada. Um, last uh, in the two of them will be the Kingdom, the Danish ambassador to Canada, Thomas Winkler. But first of all, I'd like to welcome the Canadian ambassador to the Kingdom of Denmark, Emi Furuya. Thank you very much for traveling, and it's all yours. It's right here. And it's on. Here you go. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Martin Breom. Ministers, Excellencies, friends, and partners. Kuyanak Kakuka Singa. I'm not sure how well that was done, but what I meant to say was thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you very much to the Greenland Business Association for this invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you to share some of the experiences uh, Canada has had uh, in our north and also to discuss collaboration with Greenland. I realize I'm the first person and perhaps the only one, so hopefully this will work. Great. So I would first like to just set the stage a little bit about Canada's north and what it means for Canada. I know many in Greenland are very familiar, of course, already with our north, but just to explain a little bit of what this means for us. Of course, the north, and when I say the north, simplified above the 50th parallel and in the Arctic, uh, as well, of course, is a huge part of our country. We have 25% uh, of the global Arctic, uh, which makes us the second largest uh, Arctic state in terms of land mass in the world. Uh, our indigenous population is about 1.7 million. We have, in, in our north, we have about 120,000. So like we see in many Arctic regions and states, of course, the populations in the northern communities are more sparse uh, and more far, uh, farly, uh, not as close together, more remote. Northerners in Canada are living in very different types of communities, varying from uh, rural communities to very urban uh, environments, and also have the spectrum of livelihoods, again, from very modern uh, commercial environments to traditional livelihoods, hunting and fishing. Canadians and the Arctic and the North are very core parts of, our, of who we are. Uh, we have, of course, uh, our indigenous populations who have been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, but it also is a very important part of who we are and how we identify as Canadians and as a state. So I just wanted to give this uh, as a bit of a scene setter, but also to see how very clo close, of course, Greenland is to us. You can see Greenland on the map. Uh, we share a 2,000 kilometer border, and we, of course, have long standing historical, ethnic, uh, ethnic, uh, linguistic ties, but also commercial ties that go back for quite some time. Given this conference is focused on uh, the economy, uh, I wanted to focus on some of the key sectors in the Canadian North to talk a little bit about our experiences and perhaps share some of the lessons that we have learned in this regard. So first, looking at the mining sector. 
I would like to say thank you for those from Greenland in this sector who were able to come to the, the PDEC conference, the Prospectors Developers Association conference in Toronto earlier this year, the largest mining conference, of course, in the world. And one of those opportunities, I think, where Greenland and Canadian partners have an opportunity to exchange, to try and facilitate and build new partnerships. The mining sector is, of course, key for our north. Like Greenland in our north, we have the, the benefit of uh, a wonderful natural resource wealth uh, across our north, both in Yukon, uh, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. But also to say, of course, we are also uh, challenged with very similar environments. A few of those are listed here. Of course, the climate, the remoteness, the challenges of connectivity, remote uh, environments, uh, limited infrastructure in many instances. So some of the keys that Canadian companies have found operating in these environments. A few of them are highlighted here. Taking a sustainable approach to mining. This means looking at projects at a very holistic, in a very holistic way, looking at everything, of course, from the usual operational efficiencies, inputs and outputs, but looking very much at the environmental footprint and what that means for the communities in which they are operating. That has been a key to some of the success of the Canadian companies operating in our north. Um, needless to say, a stable regulatory environment and framework, rules that are very clearly understood, easily accessible, and clearly implemented has been also very key for the sustainability of the Canadian companies operating in the north. Community engagement. Uh, we have something, and this is a decades-long practice, something called impact benefit agreements, and I understand you have similar practices here in Greenland, where the Canadian companies are operating very much in partnership and close collaboration with the communities themselves, which means in the conception and the design of the projects, they are looking at both the long term, but also ensuring that the benefits are coming back to the communities. And this has been critical in the sustainability and the success of Canadian companies operating in the region. Education, and I will echo that, we heard that a lot this morning, it's not on that slide, but that's not to say that this isn't a critical and real uh, concrete sector for the mining industry, in fact. We have great universities and colleges across our country, but what has been very important in the mining sector in particular is we have a lot of specialized colleges and universities that are focusing specifically on the mining sector, and this has meant that companies, uh, clusters of mining companies that are near these hubs of institutions and colleges ha has had an automatic uh, uptake of both graduates, so people who are trained and specialized in mining and working in these environments, but also very importantly, all of the research and development, all of the R&D and innovation that's happening at these institutions has also been an extremely valuable feed in to the companies and the mining sector as a whole. So that has been education and in our institutions have been a key element in driving the mining industry and maintaining uh, the sustainability. I would like to mention also, and a few have talked about the institutes here in Greenland, we do have a lot of very useful collaboration. We've had uh, Greenlandic researchers and students coming to Canada, and I would say I was quite impressed uh, going to Sisimiut also in an earlier trip with your um, tech college and your mining school. Similar, it looks like, in terms of approach in making sure that the students are actually getting very hands-on experience in, uh, in uh, mining and hands-on and that the, what they're learning is very applicable to your local environments. And that has been a key to the success in, uh, in the Canadian environment. Um, specialized expertise. I guess that goes without saying. There are, of course, many states, many countries, many companies that have experiences in mining. One of the keys, of course, to operating in our north has been developing very specialized uh, expertise to, de to work in these types of harsh uh, environments. We have a number of Canadian companies, of course, operating in our north, some also here. Just if I could flag one example um, of a company when I was talking about thinking sort of beyond just the operation, Agnico Eagle, uh, Agnico Eagle, which operates in our north, for instance, has identified as a corporate priority employee development. And employee development has not meant just uh, very high and ongoing training and workplace uh, standards, but it has meant that the company has really taken on and, and owned these, uh, these uh, employees in the sense that they will ensure these employees have ongoing training. If there is a mine that is closed, for instance, they would be working to ensure 
re-employment at another mine, and also retraining that would be applicable for these employees. That has meant both sustainability and stability for, for the company, but also for the communities and the employees, job security and ongoing relevance in terms of training, which has been really important for the profile in our industry. So these are a couple examples of the success uh, in the mining industry. We do have a few operating right now in Greenland and hopefully with many opportunities uh, to continue Hudson Resources with their White Mountain project near Kangalusuak. We have uh, North American Nickel doing prospecting in the west of Greenland and we have AEX or Alopex Gold in southern Greenland. The mining industry in Canada has been uh, very prosperous and very sustainable, and this has also meant that, in fact, growth and economic growth in our northern territories has typically been actually better than in our southern provinces. So all this to say, mining can certainly be a driver and be done in a very sustainable way. Uh, fish and seafood is actually our largest uh, area of bilateral trade in goods between Canada and Greenland. Our levels have been quite stable in recent times with uh, the changing uh, climate that we've heard about earlier today. We have seen types of stocks adjusting and changing, so the variety, <coughs> excuse me, the variety of our exchange has also uh, broadened in recent times to include things like lobster, crab, scallops, and so on. We would hope to see, of course, uh, continued uh, evolution of that relationship increase in, uh, in volume, but also uh, continuing uh, exchange in terms of stock. Uh, Royal Greenland is one of the biggest uh, players in Greenland, and certainly probably the biggest uh, Greenlandic player currently in Canada. You have uh, five uh, processing facilities in eastern uh, Canada and in Quebec. It has been extremely uh, positively seen, I think, in the Canadian environment the know-how that uh, Royal Greenland has brought to Canada, the environment, uh, the environmental awareness, also the aware awareness of different stocks and so on, has been key to adjusting the type of business model that we have uh, in Greenland, uh, sorry, from Greenland and also in Canada to adjust uh, processing styles, even processing uh, methodologies and processing different types of stocks. As I mentioned earlier, transitioning, for instance, from fish uh, and shrimp to lobster in some instances. And that has been a real synergy and a positive collaboration between this Greenlandic company and local processing plants. Finally, I wanted to flag uh, an example of uh, collaboration and potential collaboration. In this sector, we will be hosting in November, I believe, the International Cold Water Prawn Forum in Newfoundland. So those of you who may be interested or may be thinking of going, certainly encourage and would welcome Greenlandic partners to come to that and open to answer questions. The embassy, of course, would be keen to be able to facilitate uh, your participation as well. Another key area, of course, uh, of growth and uh, key uh, sector and industry in our north is infrastructure. Very much like the mining experience in Canada, it has a lot of opportunities and certainly a tremendous amount of challenges operating in a very specific environment. I wanted to flag, as, we, as we've heard so much, the key to infrastructure uh, is opening up doors to so many communities and really allowing uh, economies to grow. The challenge, of course, is infrastructure is challenging and infrastructure is extremely expensive. Recognizing this, and I'm just flagging the most recent uh, budget investment in that, $2 billion, uh, which is about 10 billion uh, Danish crowns, in our 2017 budget was fo focused exclusively on northern and rural communities. And this was seen as a very important investment in order to really ramp up some of the infrastructure uh, in our northern and rural communities, which of course is very badly needed. I'm flagging one uh, project that was under this program. It was called a project mapping tool, and it was found to be extremely useful in trying to facilitate public-private partnerships. It is literally a map of our, our north with specific uh, dots for different projects, and when you click on those dots, you can see the specificities of each project, the infrastructure needs, the funding availabilities, and that was seen as a really useful tool for the private sector to see how can we partner with uh, government in delivering some of these uh, very specific infrastructure needs? 
As we've seen uh, here in Greenland, the Canadian experience is similar. We have a P3 uh, collaboration project in Iqaluit, uh, which was very successful, and it has uh, it was apparently the only P3 airport project in North America, but it was seen as a very successful collaboration between, of course, the security of government funding operating in an environment which is sometimes unstable in terms of climate and schedules, but also giving uh, the, the private sector and the local communities the feed-in to make sure that the needs of those communities were very well reflected in the design of those projects. Tourism and mobility, as we've heard a little bit earlier, of course, receding uh, ice levels has meant an increase in mobility, commercial traffic, freight traffic, cruise traffic, and so on. Those areas that are white are areas that are frozen uh, in the winter months. And that, of course, uh, this picture is changing every year, uh, and we are adapting accordingly. I won't talk too much about the environmental uh, and uh, the measures that we're taking to make sure communities and infrastructure is adapted and so on, but that is a key priority absolutely for Canada and the government. But simply to say on the mobility side, uh, the reality of course is changing. The need for things like ice breaking capabilities for ferry services and so on has increased exponentially in recent years. And we're looking at addressing mobility in very different ways looking at how we can facilitate mobility of individuals and companies across international borders. We've addressed some of this in our uh, north with Alaska and Yukon, and we're looking as well right now with how we can look at the same type of mobility arrangement between uh, Canada's north in Nunavut and with Greenland. Tourism is also an area we're not anywhere near the Icelandic <laughs> experience, but to say that we are very conscious, of course, uh, in these northern communities of the heavy dependence on a certain number of uh, very focused economies, whether it be fishing, whether it be natural resource development, and we're very keen, of course, as a government to make sure that as to the extent possible, we can diversify these economies. Tourism is certainly one area that we're also addressing and trying to invest in to make sure that the local communities are able to welcome tourists coming through, whether it be cruise traffic or otherwise, making sure they have the capabilities and the tools to develop that, but also that they are able to benefit from the, the ongoing traffic and the exponential increase and the potential that lies in tourism. Finally, Arctic research and collaboration was also mentioned uh, earlier today, and I'd like to say this is also a very important priority for Canada in uh, the Finnish uh, Arctic Council Ministerial just last week. We announced additional investments in this area. We have a long history of uh, ongoing research and collaboration in the Arctic in particular. We're very keen to see this uh, continue. I've just flagged two uh, research, their, their connected polar knowledge, which is very uh, focused and has been mandated on increasing knowledge in the Arctic and increasing international collaboration. And our Canadian High Arctic Research Station, which is largely operational now out of Cambridge Bay, is very much a facility and a center to enhance and to encourage international collaboration. I must say we have some uh, strong collaboration already. Sometimes we find out when we visit different communities and different institutions. We do have memorandas of understanding between different uh, organizations as well. For instance, between the University of Manitoba, the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources, and Aarhus University. And just mentioning these institutes here, we have a new collaboration also between the Danish Agency of Science and Higher Education with Polar and with an early research center and exchange program that will be based including uh, at the Arctic Station on Disco Island and at the High Arctic Research Center in Cambridge Bay. So all of this to say, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for uh, more collaboration. We have, I think, so many similarities between our environments and our experiences. Much of this is happening at so many different levels, but I think that there is almost an endless amount of collaboration that could take place between Greenland and Canada, and as I say, a very close uh, fondness and relationship between uh, our North and Greenland, which we're very keen to see develop and deepen further. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Ambassador. Just. 
Thank you very much. I, I think a lot of people in this room appreciate the long-standing and still developing uh, relationship with Canada. So, so just not to miss this opportunity, just in case I forget, are there any concrete plans to open a diplomatic office in Nuuk? <laughs> <laughs> Don't put me on the spot or anything, Martin. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, currently, there are not. Uh, we have, and we are doing similar to what the U.S. has been doing uh, over the past year. We are trying to increase our engagement through the number of visits and so on. Our, we, of course, we don't have uh, a military presence here. We have a lot of collaboration. Our numbers right now are not necessarily warranting an ongoing presence based here. But all that to say, certainly ongoing visits. And I would not necessarily say never say never. Uh, we do, the more Canadian interests we have based here will obviously increase the interest of our, our government in having a stable presence. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to inviting you back into the panel just uh, in a few minutes while I welcome our uh, ambassador to Canada. Uh, Thomas Winkler is the former ambassador to Moscow. Uh, he has been working on Arctic issues for a long time and he is now the Kingdom of Denmark's ambassador to Canada based in Ottawa, and now he's right here with us. Thomas, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's uh, great to be back in Nuuk. It's been some eight years since I was here the last time, so I can really see that a lot of things is uh, happening. Uh, I, I will uh, limit myself to offering a few comments building on what my uh, Canadian colleague in, in Copenhagen has just said and focused on the uh, commercial relationship between Canada and Greenland, try to answer the question of this conference, what, what, what does it take? What does it take to actually make it happen? I know some of you will not believe me because uh, I'm an ambassador uh, saying that, but uh, I'm actually the hands-on. Ambassadors can be hands-on. Yeah? We're not alone. I, I, I realize that. I'm working closely with my colleague, the Greenlandic representative uh, to Canada, who is living in, in Washington, and of course my commercial colleagues in Toronto to promote Greenlandic trade and Canadian Greenlandic business uh, out of Ottawa and Toronto. Uh, I assure you, I'm sure, or I hope, you will believe him when I say we are very, very good at opening doors, because that's what we do. And that's what we are ready to do for Greenlandic business as well in Canada and Canadian business in Greenland. It's actually, and you heard it from my Canadian colleague's presentation, it's actually going quite well. We do see an increase in the business relationship between Canada and Greenland. I, however, think that there's a much greater potential. This potential is not limited to, let's say, cooperation between Greenland and the Canadian Arctic. There are more opportunities, I think, in small enterprise cooperation uh, across there. But I think it's very important when we're sitting here in Nuuk and in Greenland that we look at all of Canada and see the investment opportunities both for Greenlandics uh, investments in Canada and Canadians investments in uh, Greenland. Are there challenges? Oh, yes. I'm not going to mention infrastructure, right? We've all mentioned infrastructure. We have a side event later today where we will focus solely on infrastructure and hopefully find the right answers uh, to those challenges. But when you're sitting in Ottawa, there's another challenge when you're working for Greenland in Canada, and that's the basic challenge of knowledge. Do Canada and Canadians actually know Greenland? I mean, the diplomatic answer would be yes, of course they do. The true answer will be yes and no. Because, of course, the, the, the Canadians living in the Canadian North, they know Greenland very well. And Greenland is, a, for many of them, a role model. And there's a lot going on already on exchange between Greenland and the Canadian Arctic. And more should even happen. To pick up of all the other speakers this morning, whenever we talk to Canadian youth in the Canadian Arctic and say, what, what, what do you really need? The answer is, we want to talk to the Greenlandic youth and for that matter, the Russian youth in the Arctic, Norwegian youth, and so on. So we're still not there where we've actually been able to pick up and do that dialogue to the full. But that's the Canadian Arctic. 
If we go further south, and I'm sure, Amy, I'm not insulting anybody by saying, and you can see it on the map, most of the Canadians is actually living a bit further south, uh, to put it uh, diplomatically, very close to the border of the U.S. And, and sometimes when you ask Canadians, let's say in the southern Alberta, about their northern neighbor, they become a bit sort of uh, fussy in their answers. So there is a task for us together to promote Greenland even more all over Canada. There's much to build on. It's not a big issue. It's just something we need to do. It's something we do out of the uh, embassy in Ottawa under the headline Neighbors in the North and trying to promote Greenland all over Canada. Being a bit sort of, you mentioned the PDAC, Amy. PDAC was an excellent example of how we can do it. When Nuke, Copenhagen, Ottawa, Toronto, and in this case the Royal Court in Copenhagen, which did help a bit as well, when they work together and promote Greenland as we did in Toronto, it is really something that has an impact, not only on mining, but also broader. And I think, what does it take? It takes not only business cooperation, this takes a broad cooperation between Greenland and Canada in culture, in science, as was mentioned, in youth dialogue to promote the brand of Greenland more broadly across Canada, and this is one of the things that we're doing in, at the Embassy in Ottawa to help to promote this economic cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. And please remain on stage. Uh, we will now invite all the speakers of this morning up here for a panel discussion, and I hope somebody will bring a few more tables. And I will ask all the speakers to please bring up here also your translation devices to the degree that you need them, because we will now speak in three languages as we go. Ach, <laughs> Ja, der er forretninger i i Natsisatut i øjeblikket. Jeg ved, at Vitus Royatis og Ane meget gerne ville være med, men så vidt jeg kan se, at de har ikke lige pt. Så går vi i gang og håber, at de øh, når frem, mens vi er i gang. Ja. Der var en mat. Abelkuti sa si ulla. Muti bi en. Abelkuti er også tak på det savok. Bekati er lunis ulla kati en. Kanok pinga ut sa Amadu <laughs> Ustomic 
Thank you. Uh, we will jump uh, the topics and the languages. So I'm practicing now also your headsets. <laughs> and I would like to jump to uh, one of the uh, complications, I could call it, uh, Ambassador Villian, uh, that arose during the presentations this morning was uh, on China. You talked of the infrastructure being built with Chinese funding, the opportunities. And we heard from the ambassador from the United States how China is stealing intellectual property, promoting crumpling infrastructure, and basically issuing a warning that we also heard last week from Secretary of State Michael Pompeo in Rovaniemi, that cooperation with China is very, very perilous, to put it mildly. How should we understand your message then? I thought you... Sorry, is it on? Is it on? Yes. I was wondering that you might be asking me the question that is European Union planning to establish an institute or, or the information office here in Inuk? <laughs> I would be willing to try to answer that question. <laughs> but no, no, actually, I think the, both pictures are correct. China is a challenge and opportunity to, to all of us. Uh, I think what the U.S. has been saying are, are fair warnings and, and, and concerns that U.S. administration has put forward very clearly, uh, very, very clearly, especially in the Rovaniemi, but also repeating in here. Another side of course the story is also that China is an opportunity for the various kind of cooperation. As said, if he can find the common ground for the cooperation. Same thing actually comes with Russia, as I mentioned. And same comes also with the United States. I think we can find a common ground for European Union for cooperation with all of the players in the Arctic. And I think this exactly should be the ambition that we have. How to find the common cooperation areas and find the places where we can cooperate. And the, there was a meeting recently in European Union leadership and, and the Chinese leadership and maybe I just use one word which was, was the dominant word in, in that discussion by the President Juncker. He said reciprocity. We need to have reciprocity with China. We need to have a common ground, we need to have a common rules, and we have to find the reciprocity in our cooperation. We should not be naive, but we should be open for the cooperation. Uh, there are issues which are concerned, and then we need to consider for common legislation on the issues. For example, I, I can mention my native country, I'm, I'm a Finnish, so I mentioned. We have a legislation concerning the vetting on investment from the China. This is one of the clear tools that we have decided. From the European Union member states, I think the Germany, to, to mention one, is the one probably having most active discussion that what kind of Chinese investments are welcome, what kind of Chinese investments are seen as, as a concern. And in that, I think it's important that we share our views and opinions and share the information we have on, on, on that. And I think that is the, the answer that I have. And next question, I can try to in, respond on this uh, information office of the European Union. In the <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Kinem and the tow swam the one pure. Do not swam at the station num the one num me, the world sees a face in North Missani, Kinemina need Pisia and Rattaput. The mam a statue at the station num in a real tortici soot, our cocuminato, Kin up a statue to the Catinissa. Kisia need a caviatio, Nunaki said a good nitchin is to the Catis in Nana put peri officers or Catis in our paput. Apple could see so Cassinana, Briafis, who does some mud. 
tama met eh yaga si masoka met apekut soka kusut tumik na para yaklu si tawa esektor yaklu it am eh ayoko eh sudah kat sigut mikrofonim sigut miaktut ab okay mat eh ane Sofia ima si usiwa we need microphones eh yeah tungo yung tumay ng kaya siling kakani isya so Ja, mit navn er den tændt. Ja. Mit navn er Anna-Sophie Skjævdal. Jeg er Ph.D. i borgerinddragelse. Og jeg kunne godt tænke mig at spørge dig, Mute. Øhm, her til formiddag der er der blevet lagt meget vægt på vigtigheden af inddragelse af befolkningen. Og øh, Vitus han nævner, at tålmodighed og omhyggelighed det er, en, det er vigtigt øh, for planlægningen af Grønlands fremtid. Samtidig så har vi den her forfatningsforberedende proces, som er givet en meget kort tidsramme, og der skal ligge et udkast færdigt her om to år. Og jeg tænker, at selve processen mod selvstændighed, den er mindst lige så vigtig, hvis ikke mere vigtig, end i forhold til målet. Og jeg vil derfor gerne spørge, hvordan man vil sikre en tilstrækkelig involvering af den grønlandske befolkning i den her proces. Sekarang sokong cina nak tuin nak bok. Nampak nasun pilih tu suri ed ingat sesi mana kat okaru ia cinc kiri tetapi apa? Teka cinc ni asli pilih sekarang usi wisu cinc sok atom nak sesi mana sok inutah sam aku cinc nak amnisat terkasa cinc tu. Inutah sudah cinc nak amnisat siok kut tu. Idiu sekarang nak ukiu ni kodi ni minna pamik isu mario kat cinc ten makan pilih sesi cinc tu ngah wisin nak sesi mana. Tama masak politik kiri kut pilih sesi sesi mana nama ngira. Ukiu masuk, nunam tam isu waktu cuci sumi, inutas nama tu mik, tunggu yusum inat cimik. Perkataan nisan ada kat cita mik ari yang asal nisan suri nisan ut. Pifisa kipas tahu suapun. Tamam pifisa dasu sanga kaput cuci suna usumik, aninga sedih sinda sanga kaput am cuci suna usumik. Kini gafim mik, kini gafim una suri suri asang irak. Si unisap punun katoi put, nunam mani inutas masak ut. Ina katas aku nanti tak kuat min min orang itu mungkin kuasa siunisa katoi put. Tamam pifisa dasu sanga kaput, tamat dah perkataan sinda ni cinik suria fisil. Ya, muncak ya nak. I, I would like I would like to, to draw in Thordir Gulferdotter also in this discussion. I realize it may not be your precise responsibility on a daily basis, but I know that in Iceland you have also had very recently a very extensive discussion about the constitution. So could you share with us some of the experiences that you have had in establishing a democratic discussion on your constitution recently. But uh, of course, our constitution is based on the Danish one. Uh, but we also have a discussion on the constitution in regard to uh, international cooperation and international relations. And um, th this discussion reflects, especially these days, around the third energy package, which is just the regulation from the European Union, which goes then through the AEA agreement and is very sensitive because it touches upon our resources, our energy, and uh, people are sensitive and 
it's really difficult to discuss how it, when you're talking about resources and when you're talking about ener energy as a product. And uh, you, you feel that because we, I think, I think most of Icelanders know that the EA agreement is very uh, important to us. And in my mind, part of being um, independent as a country is the international relations and international cooperation. And with open economy, it's easier to be independent. If we weren't, if we weren't uh, part of the EA agreement, if we weren't part of NATO, if we didn't have these international relations, I don't know how easy it would be to stay independent. Um, so the discussion is moving now, and, and people like me that believe in international cooperation and relations, an open economy, um, we need to put our foot down and speak very clearly, uh, because it seems to be very fragile when you start talking about uh, isolation versus open economy. So this, this discussion on the energy package and the constitution, it, it goes together, and then the EA agreement is somehow reflected, because we don't, we don't have a majority that wants to join the European Union, but we have a clear majority that, that wants to protect the EA agreement, because it's really necessary for a small, mm. isolated country as Iceland. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Michael Kelsen, this is a question to Minister Gulfedot here. Uh, during your um, speech, you mentioned the collapse of Wow Airline just recently, and you suggested that uh, this may give a, a slowdown of the uh, Icelandic uh, tur tourism. Um, I am aware that some of the Icelandic press has suggested that Iceland, with respect to the tourist industry, is more or less on its way into the same as happened 10 years ago with the banking sector. And uh, lots of reasons uh, suggested, but partly is, there's a lot of amateurism, things are like moving too fast, environmental issues, etc., etc., etc. I do not know whether this is true, but uh, I would like to hear if you have any uh, recommendations uh, to Greenland who is on its way to boost increased tourism uh, how to do it in order to avoid what has happened in Iceland thank you thank you for the question um, uh, it is true like I mentioned uh, I think I believe that the environment within the tourism sector is going to change in Iceland for the next couple of years um, and it will probably be harmful, partly, but really necess uh, necessary as well. Uh, because everyone knew, and it's okay to say it out loud, and I've been doing so for the last couple of years, that the growth we have seen in Iceland is not sustainable. It's not sustainable to have 20% growth year by year by year by year in a, in a sector, in any sector, and especially in a sector where we rely on um, the nature, and we need the infrastructure, we need to protect the nature, and like I mentioned, today we have seven tourists per one Icelander. So we have 340,000 people, 2.3 million tourists. And that means, like I mentioned, we need to import a lot of labor. And in general, that has been going good, so I answer the question that he mentioned before, Martin. Um, but it means also pressure on housing market. Uh, and everything. So the, the tourism sector puts pressure on every infrastructure. That's why we are working on this um, uh, impact assessment, where we're trying to figure out how much does Iceland handle in regards to the economy, how big can it be, in regards to the environment, and in regards to the society. So um, I would not gr agree at all that it, this, is, this is nothing similar to 2008. And we are not going in that direction. 
Um, but we are, when we have a bit um, less growth now this year, it will probably increase again in 2019, but not, not about 20%. So we need to use this time very wisely. Um, and sustainable growth is uh, important. And also to, for the tourism sector to develop in a sustainable manner. So I would say for Greenland, you know, the number of tourists is not the main issue. It's all about quality over quantity. And if I can say one sentence to Greenlanders, it would be quality over quantity. And when you Greenland, you have much bigger land, fewer habitants. So that means you don't need that many tourists. You just need to serve them well, so they spend money, so they, so they behave in a sustainable manner, and leave the value in Greenland. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Minister Gilfeldotter. And you mentioned again this interesting fact that one third of the people who work in tourism in your country are foreigners. I like the uh, two of the ambassadors here. We've got all sorts of ambassadors. Uh, but <laughs> the, the, the Canadian ambassador to the kingdom, your country has also been very consciously addressing this issue of immigration for many, many years. So I'd like you, and I'd also like you, uh, uh, Gilfer to, to tell us a little bit about how you manage the influx of a lot of people from abroad. Is this on? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I will answer the question perhaps looking beyond the tourism sector. We do have a huge uh, and ongoing tradition, of course, of taking in large numbers of immigrants and refugees. This is part of our demography and part of our history, of course. Currently, we take in about 330,000 immigrants per year, so a target of one million every three years. This has been a very conscious effort and also 50 to 50,000 refugees, so we have a number of different types of programs, but I would say looking at tourism or our economy as a whole, part of that strategy is, of course, a very conscious intake of immigrants from many different countries with many different expertise. We have a very complicated immigration system that I won't get into. Some of it is very targeted. It's a point system about certain sectors in the economy that we're looking for specialized expertise, and that immigration will feed and go directly into that labor force. And part of it is also the conception when we're taking in refugees, which could be coming from many different parts of the world in alphabet, not speaking English or French. But part of our reality is we are a huge country in terms of land mass, 37 million, a lot of people, but still not enough to continue growing our economy. And so much of, is the, of our growth is contingent upon ongoing innovation, ongoing growth, and uh, economic development, entrepreneurship, we ha heard a lot about this morning as well. And a lot of this is coming from these communities. So diversity, ongoing immigration is really a part of our economic strategy in a way mm -hmm. across sectors in tourism, but also across the board. That's very interesting because this, of course, is a challenge that Greenland is very much looking at now, how to possibly include a lot more people from outside. And I understand in Iceland, you have made sort of legal structures available for businesses so that they can import labor very easily. Could you tell us something about that? Uh, yes, well, in, in my opinion, we should do much better in that regard. Iceland needs to be more open uh, to, especially when it comes to foreign, um, foreign uh, people that have certain skills that we need. Uh, because we are an open economy and we have a lot of strong uh, companies and it's, uh, it's easy to start a company and the entrepreneurship is, is strong as well, but still, in my mind, we need to be even more open. Um, and here we're discussing all kinds of things when it comes to refugees, asylum seekers, uh, foreign labor, and then specialists. If I may, you know, put it in groups, because <laughs> in Iceland, in my mind, we need to discuss this um, 
in a more diverse way because, for example, in Iceland, the discussion on asylum seekers and refugees is much more sensitive than the discussion on foreign labor and, and uh, specialists. Uh, and in my opinion, we are lacking a policy when it comes to immigration in general. Uh, but in regards to tourism and foreign laborers, uh, we just, we, we really need them. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why it's going good, because every Icelander knows that we can't do it without them. But uh, if I should be totally honest, I'm not sure, hopefully it will still be good, but I, I, I'm not sure if it will uh, stay the same if the economy wasn't as strong as, as it is. You know, people have more tolerance when things are going good. Then when things change, you get, it gets more sensitive. Um, so that's why the discussion is important. But to be an open economy, with, uh, we need to import brain powers. That's why we need more specialists, in my, in my opinion, in Iceland. Yari Vilin. Just a, I don't take a stand on the migration, as you know, how complicated issues inside the European Union. But maybe it's just one statistical fact that comes from research done in the European Union for all of us to consider. Do the demographic changes in all over in Europe, by 2050, to maintain the current level of, of economical activities and providing the services, we would need to have in the Europe, in the Europe, 50 million work-based migrants even to respond to the current services we have. Because we're losing 40 million people because of the old age. We can, of course, try to find people staying longer and longer in the work life and having a higher quality of life and healthy. But the statistic, the, just a pure statistic says, by 2050, Europe would need to have a 50 million people coming to work in, in our societies. That's an enormous challenge. Yeah, I know. For those of you who don't understand Greenlandic, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, easier to, to say that uh, we welcome uh, the uh, American presence in, in Greenland. I think it gives us uh, a unique possibility to address directly to U.S., in matters concerning Greenland. I think it's natural for us to participate and to discuss matters dealing with Greenland and U.S. directly. So I welcome the American consulate uh, that is coming to Greenland. Yeah. Uh, on the discussions on the foreign labor uh, there are very few things uh, I need to address before we discuss uh, the Greenland responsibility of matters dealing with the foreign workers. First, we are working and aim at diversifying our economy in order to gain development within tourism and the extractive industry. For that, uh, the Greenland Parliament has passed what we call a large-scale act that enables Greenland to attract foreign laborers without any restrictions during the construction phase. We also anticipate that uh, the use of foreign labor will be immense, not only in the extractive industry, but in general. We see foreign labor in the service, in the service um, industry already we see foreign labor used in the fishery plants today. So there is a greater need uh, for foreigners in Greenland. The Greenland Parliament have uh, already discussed an analysis on how we can assume the power to make our own decisions dealing with the foreign labor. There are working, lab uh, working permits along with... Um, with 
the transit uh, permits uh, in Greenland, uh, the two things that uh, is under Danish authority today. It restricts us to have a direct dealing with the foreigners and it enabled us uh, to make quick decisions dealing with the foreigners. So these are only two comments I wanted to make. Okay. All right, thank you for really good presentations. My name is Anna Mette Christensen. You all speak about economic development, partnerships, and sustainable development. In 2015, the world agreed on a framework for just that, called the UN Sustainable Development Goals, or Agenda 2030. The only one addressing the framework directly was WITUS, so I'll have a question for the rest of you. What role, in your opinion, should the Sustainable Development Goals play as a framework for development in the Arctic. Thank you. Mm. Muti. This tunga we okay sa tagaya kaput. I'm inu at kacigini nga ni tuwot. Ukiwaru matumasiyon kini gafiu siuri ani. Tunga we garu it na na gafit pa kacigit akon akon nani tamatut stay kimik siun na fakam na it nuna tina matuti dan nisa siun na suti ni ko wap tamam nuna. If I continue, we go then around. But um, you didn't listen to my speech carefully enough. If I, if I quote to you exactly what I said, the European Union should promote economic activities and development in the Arctic when, where and when it can be done in a sustainable manner in line with the European Union binding climate change targets and obligations and taking into account the impact of its fragile environment and traditional livelihood of those living there. So European Union is truly, truly committed on, on the targets that we put in for ourselves. And as I mentioned, I presume, and this is my prophecy, and I'm looking in the crystal ball, I presume the next European Parliament will be even more ambitious with these targets. Just to add on this uh, very shortly, um, because in, in Iceland, these goals are uh, very well known and within every policy that is worked on and implemented by the government, the goals are measured in every action we, uh, we take. And uh, so I would believe, you know, both within the government, the parliament, even the municipalities, and especially the younger people, everyone, I would assume that the, the vast majority of Iceland knows the goals and finds it important that we measure our actions to uh, the goals. And so when it comes to the Arctic, I would say that it, it should be the, the core of the work and the development, those goals. Okay. Yes, Ambassador Furoya. Thank you for, thank you for that. Um, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the simple answer is it is the core of also what we are working in in the Arctic. As you're seeing here in Greenland, and I think the reality that we're hearing from all of the communities across our north is Climate change is happening here. Climate change is happening here faster, and it's hitting our communities. So every part of our investment and our collaboration with these communities, whether it be infrastructure development, small business development, and direct uh, investments in alternative energies, trying to green, getting off of diesel, and so on in these communities, is absolutely the core of our investments in the north. We're seeing things, black carbon, and things we've talked about before, we are very conscious of these uh, impacts and we are working very hard to address those both domestically but also in international and different multilateral fora like we saw in the Arctic uh, Council Ministerial last week. Huge uh, effort and frankly huge priority by almost all of course of our Arctic Council partner states to have climate change recognized and invested integrally in the work that we're doing through multilateral bodies. Uh, and that is absolutely core to what Canada is doing as well. Thank you. Yeah. Koya nakta ina swam epe kutsa kaptu sa tusi maksuk eta tsikut epe kutsi sa tusa lare yaksu tsi sa onem tusa rese sui tawa eki sui tsaka tsiku makpout. Si usak <laughs> sa otsui tawa tusi wok kano ma aya ya. Microphone iki lakse nava.
up. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> My name is Saul Svi. I'm a former politician. Today I work for the Danish National Committee of the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF. Um, uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentations and a very good uh, focus this morning on, on some of the very uh, real challenges we have in the Arctic. Um, this conference happens, as, as also Martin said in the beginning of, of, of this morning, one week after an Arctic Council meeting where we actually see a different challenge in regards to the diplomatic collaboration and the ability to agree on resolutions um, across of the eight Arctic uh, states and many Arctic indigenous peoples and, and nations. Um, so I would be quite interested now that Anamid already asked the questions about the, the, the sustainable development goals. I would like to ask you how you, uh, all of you individually see uh, the future of the Arctic Council because this is the most important uh, forum for collaboration going all the way around the Arctic. And we do have a very important task to make sure that we have this forum based on diplomacy and dialogue. Should it in the future be still a consensus-based forum? Uh, do you see anything that makes you worried about uh, the future and the ability to actually be uh, in dialogue in the way that we have been for many, many years now about our common future? I think all of the themes that we have talked about today already lays out the, 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 the very clear picture of how important it is to be able to agree on things in, uh, in order for us to actually also make um, different kinds of, um, uh, what do you call it, results uh, in the Arctic. So this uh, issue about the Arctic Council and should it maintain, be maintained as a consensus-based forum or is there other ways? And how worried are you about the development we saw last week? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's have another question as we go. Jeg er Kemnitz Larsen, medlem af Folketinget på vegne af Inuit Adaratiet, forhåbentlig også efter et folketingsvalg. <laughs> Men øhm, jeg kunne godt tænke mig at spørge ind til vækst, fordi der er ingen tvivl om, at der er behov for bæredygtig vækst i, i Grønland. Men jeg ser også nogle faktorer, som kan bremse væksten. Øh, det ene har vi været lidt inde på, det her med, at vi er nødt til at være flere i Grønland. Der synes jeg, vi sådan... Det har taget alt for lang tid allerede indtil nu i forhold til at sikre en god løsning på det. Jeg så meget gerne, at der var sådan en fast-track-ordning, så man kunne få endnu flere folk hertil. Men det, jeg gerne vil spørge ind til til Nala Gershusut, det er investeringer. Fordi når man fra amerikansk side siger nej til kinesiske investeringer, så synes jeg også, at man er nødt til at pege på, hvor vil man så have investeringerne fra. Er amerikanerne selv villige til at kunne, kunne investere? Og hvad er Nala Gershusuts holdning? Er det et nej til kinesiske investeringer og et ja? til amerikanske investeringer. Rønne. Ha. Very strict and stringent and very difficult questions. And I want to remind you, those of you who forgot, that now that Anne Lone Baka is not here, we're lucky that Vitus also used to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greenland. <laughs> so, you can answer uh, perhaps on your your uh, personal account, you may choose. Uh, anyway, there are two distinct questions. What's the future? What should be the future of the Arctic Council now that we know the challenges? And what do we do with the warning against China from the US? <laughs> the absence of a resolution from the Arctic Council speaks louder than any other action. I think the absence of a resolution dealing with the sustainability and the Arctic in general is problematic since the Arctic Council is based on consensus between the nations involved in the Arctic Council. I think uh, the Arctic Council, as it has been since 1996, a consensus-based forum where the nations in the Arctic have the freedom to discuss matters dealing with the environment, the resources, and the livelihood in the Arctic. And I think it speaks louder that there is no resolution on important matters. Discussing with the, the growth and the investments, I think 
the Greenland government is working on attracting in investors from China, from US, from Canada, from Australia, or anywhere else. Money doesn't have any colors, but principles on matters important for democracy, etc., are politics. Of course, we have uh, um, concerns and, of course, uh, considerations of looking at where the invest investments ought to come from. I think uh, we have been attracting investors not only from China, but from everywhere general to invest in Greenland. Also from Europe, from Denmark, from France, and anywhere else. We don't distinct whether if we are dealing with China. Of course, we, uh, we look at uh, the concerns on the security matters, concerns dealing with the geopolitics, not only in the Arctic, but in the Western Hemisphere in general. We are part of NATO. There's no question about where Greenland is in politics and in security matters. We are part of NATO. I think it's important to emphasize uh, that Greenland is proud of being part of NATO and have a desire to be a reliable alliance within NATO. But uh, do we distinct investments in the extractive industry? No. Thordis Gulfredotter, you are involved in sort of creating growth, innovation, industry, economic strength in Iceland, a small economy, a very open economy. What does it mean to you that we're now facing, let's say, a different Arctic with more division, less consensus? What does it mean for your thoughts on growth in Iceland? Well, I would, I mean, we um, now have, Iceland now has two years to uh, do our best to uh, be able to have this consensus. Um, we, of course, uh, I mean, Finland did good, and uh, we are, we want to promote and strengthen the um, Arctic cooperation, connectivity, education, and, and of course, I, I mean, the general answer would be we have more things in common than we disagree on. Um, and that should always be the, the vision when you, when you have the opportunity to try to have a consensus and, and for these nations to, to work together. Um, but as a minister of innovation, in my mind, that's, that's being a, partly being a minister of the future because, uh, you know, to, to create more value and to be able to have a strong, strong economy and a strong nation, we need innovation. And uh, we need innovation in, in everything. We need innovation within tourism, within fisheries, within, within heavy industry, within education, within everything that the, um, that the government does, and, and, and even the healthcare system, which in Iceland is, is paid by taxpayers. We need innovation everywhere. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, we should... I mean, we have an ambition plan, and we, we will try to use our two years wisely. And uh, we have more things in common than, than, uh, than we disagree on. But of course, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, it's always going to be a challenge. And the issues around the Arctic is, is, is definitely going to be a challenge because now we have more and more interest. And with more and more interest, you get more challenge. You get more, uh, everyone wants, wants to have more say. It's, it's a question about power. It's a question about decision making. Um, that's why the cooperation is, is uh, so important. And that's why we need to be clear that we have more things in common that we disagree on. Thank you very much. We wish you very much luck with the next two years as chairman of the Arctic Council. There's a one question from the floor, and then yeah. I will ask uh, for, for last comments from here. Yeah. My, um, my name is Tina Goit, and I'm from Elisa Medusafik. My basic question is mostly about transportation 
and infrastructure. I'm myself from Greenland and grew up in Greenland, but, but I haven't seen my family more than 15 years, which they live in East Greenland. But I'm, I keep thinking of um, tourism, transportation, infrastructure. Is there anyone who considers about transportation? I don't travel because the prices are too high for me as a non-diplomatic person. <laughs> <laughs> and That's a very good question. How do we make room on the planes and the boats for other people than diplomats? <laughs> I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> Thank you. So, including that and the other very central key questions that were raised just prior to that, I beg you, the last four here, uh, to make your final remarks. Ambassador Villian. And briefly, I'll try to be briefly at starting. Um, about the Arctic Council, again, probably I have to be the person to say that we should not over-dramatize the decision what happened in Rovaniemi. I was bo I, Rovan is my hometown, so I can and always say that. <laughs> but the fact is that we did not have any, any suspicion that we would not have a different opinion concerning the climate change. Let, let's put very frank, we knew the US administration position on the climate change versus the other members of the Arctic Council. So let's not over-dramatize. There, there's issues that we disagree, but there's a vast majority of the issues that we have a common ground. If you look in the, the achievements of the Finnish Arctic Council presidency, looking for the challenges and program of the Icelandic, especially concerning the work in, in, the, in climate uh, change, uh, environment protections, and technical cooperation on search and rescue, and many, many issues, we have a marvelous progress, and we have done excellent results, and I have no doubt about that, that will continue also during the Icelandic presidency. The fact is, as said, the geopolitics has returned to the Arctic. It has never been away, it has been maybe a bit low on the agenda, but it is back in there. And this is reality we have to face. And when it comes all over in, in geopolitics in Arctic, um, as I tried to say before, maybe I, I tried to one more time, I think for the European Union, which is and wants to be one of the players, wants to be one of the speakers, wants to take the stand on the matters, even that we are not even observers in Arctic Council because of the geopolitics. But, but the fact is that I think it's important that we, as a European and European Union, has our own narrative what we want to have from the Arctic. We should not be only reflecting what the Chinese want to have, what the Canadians want to have, what the Americans want to have, what the Indians or Singapore or Japanese, South Koreans, they all want to be part of the players in there. I think important thing is that we would have our own common narrative, which to, to our mind combines the sustainable development, environment protection, climate change, connectivity, uh, research and innovations, and all of these elements. The connectivity is and will remain one of the priorities also for the European Union. As I said, Chinese has already made concrete plans for the 20, 30, 40 years ahead, how they want to build the connectivity. We should have our own visions on that. And part of that vision should be that this connectivity would be affordable to everybody, supporting the people, possibilities to stay at home, see their family, educate themselves, and have their businesses done in the areas they want to do that. How can we do that? I think it's a cooperation again. We need to work commonly together. European Union can be one of the players in the, in the areas where the EU is, is, is functioning and where we can do that. But it, the main thing is that, that we should all try to find the common agenda on that. And as I said, one of the issues is trying to have incentives for the companies, for the business to come to Arctic, because that is the one which is then bringing the solutions. Uh, our ambassador from the Canada gave a marvelous presentation, for example, what Canada is also planning to do itself. And just one last word, we also have very strict uh, travel budget for the European Union. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> In a real ton of time, Pisaya got chip up put. My secretary so sad again, Nunetin at Opo. I resort to Tunisis in Nangis that Ustamas, Tunisis in Nagar was six, so this was sad again for pricking a pium. But as so soap at I see in a week, in Ustisasium ping on the pam, Nunetin it to me, said Tin, my second and Miss Nathut Nadata put. I resort and not to know some in a resigning semic, 
Pilar Sao to Kaf Okun Ekerson in Ustis Sassu in Essen. Damam in Uyaka Tate or Katsil, so at Tayaka Popu. Canon it to make Arkis Susa as a mic, see only semi suits at Tokanikam Arkis Sus in Yatut, Nunet Awatanian and Chickisitis on Arkis Sonia Popu. Dakop Damam Uo in Mitchin Tunga Vigaruta, Amadu, Nunetin in Rayatono, Piuana Titinum Tunga Vislip is the Son Rasnam in Rayaton Nissan, Suriaris Arakeu. Pisaria Katsi Popu, the Minerta in Mitchin and Nasasion and Nose in Rayatot Sesu. Our <laughs> Thank you. I'd also like to comment on, on the Arctic Council just to close. I mean, we started in 1996 uh, as a group of eight Arctic states that came together. We are now, I think, in 2019 in an environment where we can't predict what's happening tomorrow, much less at the next ministerial meeting. I think that the basis of our agreement when we came together in 96 is we have shared interests. We are the eight Arctic states, and we will work together to try and advance our shared agendas. Does that mean we're going to agree on everything? Not necessarily, and I think Canada is also disappointed by what happened last, uh, last week. I don't think that means we're going to throw out the consensus-based uh, approach or what we see in terms of the value of the Arctic Council. Frankly, we've adjusted in the G7 and in other fora when we've tried to say our message is still here and some of the messages need to be passed, sometimes with interesting formulations in declarations or joint statements. So needless to say, absolute commitment to the approach and formulation uh, that we have and structure in the Arctic Council. Just to speak about uh, the mobility and uh, the challenge, of course, in costing, we face the same in Canada and we're trying very much to address that uh, domestically, but it is a little bit ironic that it's cheaper for me to get back to Toronto than it is to come here uh, to Greenland. So absolutely, uh, we feel the same uh, uh, pain in trying to actually reach out and engage our, our northern communities. And just to say, as uh, in Canada, we're diplomats when we're abroad, but what we call ourselves are actually public servants. So uh, <laughs> our also full disclosure, everything that we spend is all publicly disclosed. So yes, we don't have too much to spend, but we will invest where we need to. Thank you. Well, I, I will leave it to my political masters to, to take this d decisions, but I think my, my EU colleague said was, was very correct. I mean, we need to keep calm, I just to paraphrase <laughs> a bit. We need to analyze, and I assure, I mean, at least the diplomats, because we disagree or things change, we don't panic and, and, and roll and, and, and run away. So, I mean, I would pay a paraphrase all of, including to the Arctic Council, keep calm and keep cooperating. Thank you. Nakasuchiruchina <laughs> No me caught to me to sing out to sap to see the me, not the me, not semi. Can I me, can I cheer me, Cortaso, Macassi, and Wani, woman, the middle is so off it, been rat, Mittafidio, and the Ronisan, a soya no to serenia to serve. A kit, Unamis of Nisem, Unamis of not being out, Rapa, I'm holding it up. Yaku, begin his yes to some not to use so. A kit. The Senny a Passani San Sabinizamic Angonia Catayapu, Sinacusi, so Gisian Riopunga, Timisatus Lacati, Fit, Am Nunetini, Amasanoda, Pet on a mission and not to know the Pet, 
Thank you very much and thank you for traveling.